Try to gather your mind together right here at the breath. The breath comes in, you know it's coming in, it goes out, you know it's going out. And that's all you have to pay attention to. Anything else that comes by, just let it go. You want to gather your mind into one. We're making our minds a gift to the king tonight, the king of Thailand, who passed away just a few days ago. When you're making a gift of your mind, you want to make sure it's in good shape. You don't want to present him with a shoddy-looking present. You want to give him something that you're proud to give. So bring the mind into oneness, because that's when the mind is really at its best state. You think about the mind as it goes through the day. If you could do a picture of all the places your mind has gone today, it would be a, like a bird's nest, tangled all over the place. Not the kind of mind you want to give to anybody. It's when the mind is gathered into one at the breath. And with a sense of being an all-around awareness that fills the body. That's when the mind is at its most valuable. The reason we do this is that we think of the king. It's hard for people who haven't lived in Thailand to appreciate all, the, all that he did for Thailand, for people of every walk of life. He was the center around which the hearts of the Thai people were able to gather so that we were able to maintain a sense of unity. In spite of all the things that were happening in the in the countries on their borders. Thailand was able to hold it together. And a lot of it had to do with the king's efforts to be helpful. The program of winning the hearts and minds of people, he really knew how to do it. And going out into the jungle sometimes, many times into the jungle actually, into very poor areas to see what it was that people needed so they could stand on their own two feet. Whether it's in terms of knowledge, in terms of infrastructure. He went out of his way to provide it. And it's good to think of that, even though we may not be the direct recipients of his goodness, although in one sense we are. The fact that we have a monastery here depends on the fact that Buddhism was able to survive. It died out and basically in Laos and Cambodia, but it survived in Thailand. That's why we have it here. It was available for us to bring back here. That's a direct result of his, all of his work. When you think in general, just the fact that there's someone who's really good, who does his best to be helpful, does his best to do what's of real benefit to others. And there really is such a thing as genuine goodness in the world. I mentioned that this this morning that you read in the newspaper accounts that his obituaries, the Western accounts, tend to be kind of doubtful. Because was he really all that good? What is, there's something in our culture that really doubts goodness. And as a result, when you start doubting it, then people don't do it. And this falls in line with the, the Buddhist principles that there's two things that you don't have to doubt that are true across the board and all. Can, in all situations. One is the principle that unskillful qualities of the mind should be abandoned and skillful ones should be developed, regardless of the situation, regardless of how easy or hard it is, regardless of what kind of sacrifices you have to make. As the Buddha said, don't doubt this. Our problem is we keep com coming up with excuses. Or why we don't do our best. And sometimes we do a lot less than our best. But the excuses don't really count. This is a passage where Sariputta finds out that one of his former students has gone off and lived someplace else. His wife died and he got a new wife, and the new wife is not interested in the Dharma at all. All she was interested in is making sure her husband got a lot of money for the family. And so as I said, the in the passage says he cheated the king in the name of the people, and he cheated the people in the name of the king. He was probably a tax collector. 
And so Sariputta goes to see him and asks him, you suppose you're being dragged off to hell by the hell wardens. And if you just start telling them, well, you know, actually I had an excuse for being corrupt, being dishonest. It was for the sake of my family, for the sake of my parents, the sake of my children. Would the hell wardens listen and leave you going, or would they, would you, would they throw you to hell as you were speaking? And the man says, well, they throw me to hell as I was speaking. And so I would have said, yeah, there are lots of other ways to make a good living that don't require that you cheat. So when you have excuses for not abandoning unskillful qualities or for not developing skillful ones, ask yourself how they would look from the outside. And even though there are examples all around you of people who take the easy route, it's good to remember there have been people who took the hard route, who did what really should be done. In other words, goodness is real. The other principle the Buddha said was true across the board was the Four Noble Truths. And this too has its set of duties. You, the duty is to comprehend suffering. In other words, to see that suffering is the big problem in life and that it's something you want to comprehend. We tend to have it or run away from it. But it runs after us like a shadow. You have to turn around to face it. To face it, you have to develop the path. And you can see what the cause of suffering is, so you can abandon that. And then you can realize the cessation. Now this is a kind of pro pro <coughs> project that no one else can do for anyone else. This is something each of us has to do within. Sometimes Buddhism, is, especially Theravada, is being accused of being selfish, that saying we can't go out and save other beings. But even the Buddha himself couldn't reach into your heart and straighten things out. It's something each of us has to do for ourselves. But we're not the only ones who benefit. When you're suffering, you tend to place burdens on other people. When you're not suffering, you're a lot lighter. So there's another principle not to doubt. There's another principle that's true across the board. What can you do to comprehend suffering? We get the mind still, and you watch, and realize you're not going to be able to let go of the suffering. You have to find the cause. You let go of that. Our problem is oftentimes we want to let go of the suffering, but again, it doesn't stop it. It's like going into a house and seeing it's full of smoke. If you simply try to put out the smoke, you'll never, there'll never be an end to it. You have to find where the fire is, put that out, and then the smoke goes away on its own. So you look for the cause. Where is the craving and clinging in the mind? Now this is work that each of us has to do for ourselves. But the goodness we find inside in this way is, is actually a lot more dependable than the goodness outside. So we take heart in the fact that there are good people, people like the Buddha. Again, there's something in modern culture that says when everybody, anybody tries to speak to you, they're trying to gain power over you, so you can't trust anybody. But here the Buddha was teaching how to end your own suffering. And what could be more compassionate than that? So his compassion was genuine. There really are genuinely good people in the world. We have to look hard for them. But they're there. And the reason we look for them is because, one, we benefit directly, and two, they're good examples for us in our own behavior. They give us the encouragement. They don't have to tell us. Just, they, just by their example, they give us encouragement that goodness really is worthwhile, and it's worth whatever sacrifice has to be made. So I always hold firmly to that principle, because it is genuinely good. And it'll see you through for a long time to come. <laughs>